Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mound Science and Energy Museum Association uh, seminar for February. This is February 28th. You know, tomorrow's the 29th. Not very often. Anyhow, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we don't have snow. It's pretty cold. But anyway, it's a special night. I'm glad everyone's up. And we're going to have a, a speaker that takes us back in time. The atomic clock is going to go back to the 50s and 60s about atomic power being considered for nuclear aircraft, nuclear powered aircraft. And our speaker tonight is Leland Height. Uh, and he got his engineering degree and in, a uh, bachelor's of engineering, electrical engineering in 1966 and has worked at uh, several engineering companies. And, uh, I don't know if you work for GE? Uh, General Radio. General, General Radio. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, he was inv got involved and reviewed a, a lot of the work that was done on a nuclear aircraft and, and their engines and power, and we're just going to cover that tonight. So let's welcome Lee. Thank you, Thank you Bob, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we get started. OK, well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation to be here. The, uh, probably the first thing I need to do is to explain why I'm giving this presentation. I never worked for General Electric, and I never was involved in the uh, nuclear aircraft propulsion project. So why am I here? Well, it's because of this gentleman. <clears throat> I was minding my own business one day. The phone rang, and this is George Pomeroy. And I knew him from the engineering club that we belonged to. <clears throat> and he calls and he said, hey Lee, how would you like to review the archives for the aircraft nuclear propulsion project of GE? And I said, George, what number did you dial? <laughs> I said, I'm a double E. I have no background in nuclear. I, don't even, I never even heard of the program. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. He says, you're exactly who we want. We want someone that's not familiar with the program, has no bias in any direction, uh, but could take a technical look at it. So three months later, I finally said yes. And the reason for contacting me was that the program had a 50-year classification on it. And this was 10 years ago in 2013. So obviously, George had been waiting for that number to roll around on the calendar, because as soon as it did, he called me because now we can start talking about uh, uh, some of the aspects of the program that they were not able to talk about. Uh, so I have two mentors that guided me in my knowledge of this. George Pomeroy, he was in charge of a uh, materials engineering department at GE. It was the largest department in the program. There were 400 people in it. And there was a second gentleman, uh, David Carpenter, this gentleman that wrote this book in uh, 2000. And three, and David was the public relations person uh, down here at Evendale. Uh, David is still living. Uh, unfortunately, George has uh, passed away and no longer with us. Uh, but that's where I got the bulk of my information, plus going through the archives. So that's how all this came about. The archives are scattered. Uh, some of them are in the engineering lab or engineering library at the University of Cincinnati. You have some of them here in your library, and I still have a little bit. Uh, I put quite a bit. They wanted, to, they wanted to get this word out. So part of this whole program was to be able to do a presentation like this and, and make that information available. So there was no vehicle to do that, no money to do it. So I put it on my personal website. If you go to lehigh.org slash AMP, you get several pages, and there's a lot of documents up there that we considered more important for the public to see. So they're, they're up there, as is uh, David Carpenter's book. It used to be for sale. It's out of print. He allowed me to scan it, and so it's on the website. If you want to just read one document, read that book. Uh, it was written in 2003 before the classification came off the program. 
there's certain things you couldn't say in the book and there's a couple three mistakes but overall it's a it's a great book uh, in in, uh, in detail uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is in that book so I want to just reset the clock back to the 1940s uh, 50s this is how we did things and it took a while to do calculations so that's uh, that's how this program proceeded the first question I think everyone asks is why nuclear? Why in the world would you want to build a nuclear powered jet engine? Well, the coming out of World War II, very quickly, we catapulted into the Cold War. And so the government wanted to be prepared next time, not be drug into it the way we were in World War II. So they started several programs in parallel. The ICBM uh, proceeded quite well, was successful. There was a nuclear-powered submarine and a nuclear-powered carrier. They love weight. Nuclear reactors are, uh, have a lot of weight, so they loved uh, weight. So that those programs went along quite well. They knew how to design uh, reactors. It was a matter of making an applicable uh, onboard ship. And then they decided to do uh, uh, nuclear powered aircraft engine and that had never been done before and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is just the engine piece of this. The program's goal was to put a nuclear powered bomber on station for 30 days over Iceland and just sit there in circle and if it needed to it could jump into Russia real quick and, and start doing damage. The as the program proceeded, it started to realize that you're going to put a crew of five people in a confined space for 30 days. I don't think so. So they backed it down to uh, a week. So uh, the, the program proceeded uh, to have a crew of five on station for a week. So that, that was the, the program goal uh, of this thing. The concept actually started with the Big Boy project. They assigned two engineers to it uh, in 1942. It was an intellectual concept. It was a desktop exercise, but it was a serious one. They, they worked at it, and that proceeded uh, all, all the way from 1942. There were 10 companies involved in the program. I've got them down here listed. Uh, GE, well, um, I'll get to that in a minute. The uh, it was, overall it was an Air Force Navy project, and a huge number of companies. The overall employment for the program was 13,000 people. I'm just going to focus on the 4,000 people that were down here uh, in Evendale at the, on the uh, nuclear propulsion project. It was a, uh, a Fairchild. It, Fairchild was a prime contractor on this in terms of. Uh, of the prime contractor. Overall, a $24 billion project. There was $2 billion of it set aside for engine development. So that's, that's what I'm going to focus on. This was the stated objective. It was essentially put a bomber that could do Mach 1 at uh, fly fast, supersonic, hypersonic, something, get up there and be able to do fast, whatever you could do. So that was the stated objective. They had predetermined that it was going to take 300 megawatts to do that on a bomber. Uh, we'll find out later how that came out. As I said, the program was a two, uh, the $2 billion program. It was divided between two concepts. I'll get to this, but it's an indirect engine concept and a direct. The I'm going to deal with just the GE piece of this thing, which is the direct cycle. Uh, GE did the engine, Convair did the aircraft. There was another concept by Pratt & Whitney, and they used a Lockheed uh, airframe. We'll get to that. Uh, that was not successful for obvious reasons, but I uh, just wanted to, to identify up front here that there's two programs running in parallel. Uh, spread out considerably, spread out all over the United States. Uh, you here at Mound were involved, uh, Wright Air Development Center was involved, and you can see the companies around. Almost every nuclear facility in the country was involved, either in the uh, nuclear piece of it or the aircraft piece of it. 
but it was, a, it was a, overall just a massive program. I think one of, one of the things I thought to best give you the overall profile of this program is to look at the employment history from the beginning. We start down here in 1942 when we have an intellectual exercise, a desktop type exercise, and we move along till it almost gets canceled in the late 40s. Uh, there's an elephant in the room, and this elephant showed up, and the elephant is what are you thinking? You want to fly a nuclear reactor over people? And that became a really big concern. But it wasn't canceled. A lot of people got involved, and the program continued. GE actually got the contract in 1950, and serious money was allocated to the program, and you can see the employment took <laughs> off rather quickly. There was another surprise. The elephant showed up again in 1954 and canceled the program. The program absolutely got canceled dead. It was dead for about three to four months. They lost good people, never got them back. Had to hire new ones. And three to four months, as I recall. And they got it reactivated again, and they took off uh, toward developing this engine. The surprising thing is that it wasn't long they had made enough development that they actually had a nuclear-powered engine by mid-1955 that was running on the test stand. And the big surprise that shook up uh, almost the whole scientific community in this country was this little fellow when he showed up in 1957. It was, oh my goodness, the Russians have beat us to outer space and we're behind in that. That psychologically spurred this program on considerably. Well, if that wasn't enough, uh, there's more. A year later, part of the contract said you had to pass a 100-hour run test on a test stand. They got to 150 hours, the engine's running fine, shut it down, and then they went for the durability test passed a 1500 hour test and life is really looking good at that point. It's like we've got good engineering, good, good things going on here and then the big surprise shows up. A very respected publication, Aviation Week, published an article where the Russians were already flying a nuclear bomber and later on they will claim that they had over I think 47 flights on their nuclear bomber. So if Sputnik wasn't enough, here comes a nuclear-powered aircraft uh, by the Russians. And if anything spurred this program on, it was those two. It was like, you know, get it done. So we went on through the rest of the program. You can see up through here, uh, employment, employment went to a maximum. They maxed out at about 4,000 people. And they were going full speed ahead to have flight-ready engines. And that's where this program wound up, was, uh, was producing flight-ready engines. The elephant finally showed up in 1961 and canceled the program permanently. And it ended at that point. And that's because the nuclear-powered submarine aircraft carrier were successful. The ICBM was successful. So the government was comfortable that they had a quick response into Russia and the concern about safety was still there and it permanently got the program canceled. So as we begin talking about the engine, the very first thing that's got to be done is you've got to deal with this elephant. I mean, it's out there. It's real. Uh, all of us would be concerned if we had a nuclear reactor flying over our head damaging us or uh, other uh, uh, items of personal property, etc. So flying over is one issue, crashing and burning, spreading radiation around, that's the other part of that issue. So we've got to, we've got to deal with that. So the program decided that we need to go fly a live reactor. We need to test 
the reaction on real people, on real sensors. And that's what they set out to do, was to do radiation testing over, uh, over land. And to do that, they picked the largest bomber they could, the B-36, uh, had a cargo capacity of over 360-some thousand uh, pounds. And when they got all done with the program, they maxed out this aircraft to the maximum. But that's the aircraft they chose to do this flight uh, test of a live reactor. They modified the aircraft. They cut off the front nose and put a new nose on the front end because you had to have a hardened crew cabin. And that's what the new nose uh, looked like. And if you look at it here, uh, this is the new nose on here. And there'll be a leaded crew cabin drop, dropped in right there. I want to um, also mention that this aircraft was already using the GE uh, uh, J-47 engines, and that's the engine that they're finally going to choose to modify to make it uh, nuclear-powered. That's what the aircraft looked like after it was modified. This is an opening where they drop in the crew cabin. This is five inches of uh, leaded glass. The pilots are looking through five inches, or 12, I'm sorry, 12 inches of leaded glass as they're viewing window. Well, I'll see more about that in a minute here. It ran with a crew of five, and we'll see their crew cabin here in a minute, but that's the, the back end of the aircraft. It's a very, very large aircraft. This is the crew cabin, 12 tons, and they enter, they enter the cabin in the back of the, of the pod. It has quick connect, disconnect connectors on here, and it's literally picked up by a crane and dropped into the aircraft, and they fly the plane. When they get back home, it's picked up, taken off site, and, <clears throat> and then they leave the uh, cabin. But that's, that's the crew cabin. This is a picture of it being removed. It's not hot. It, they haven't done um, live testing yet. They're just testing the concept of using this method of getting the crew in the aircraft and out of the aircraft safely. This is the crew cabin. Uh, it's not very big, but you'll see the pilot, co-pilot up here, a defense coordinator, the guy that's running the uh, nuclear reactor, and a little galley there. And we got a funny guy down here called a bombardier. Why, why do we need a bombardier in a nuclear test flight? Well, you'll see. It's an interesting concept. This is the inside of the crew cabin. It was uh, about 18 feet long, just under 8 feet wide. Four sheets of plywood laid light, uh, long wise. And that's the crew cabin. That's all the space they got to uh, work in. Very, very confined space. They did do a, a flight simulator up at Wright Air Development Center. Uh, this is in the days, of course, when everything is vacuum tube, everything's analog. So you'll see the tape recorders down here. And they emulated the conditions, things that could go wrong with the reactor, and things that could go wrong trying to fly an airplane loaded to maximum weight. Uh, you have two very critical conditions here. This is the crew cabin, just uh, stationary right here. This is the reactor. I'll show more pictures of it. Uh, this is an uh, operating reactor that's been shut down, but it's, uh, it's fully operational. It's a one megawatt um, reactor. This it went in the bottom of the aircraft in the bomb bay, and it was stored off-site in a bunker. This is the underground bunker where the reactor is stored. This is inside the bunker, and up here is the, the aircraft is pulled over the bunker, and there's hydraulic rams that's going to push the reactor up into the aircraft. It looks like this. You're down in the bunker. Up here's the aircraft and you're going to lift this reactor up into the aircraft, uh, connect, get it connected up, and it's shut down at this point. Uh, it was, GE did not build this reactor. It was built by Convair. It was a one megawatt uh, 
water moderated and water cooled reactor. Oops. Here is an articulated hardened crane. These are uh, mobile or powered wheels down here on all four corners. This is a completely hardened crane. And again, a very thick uh, leaded glass viewing window for the operator. But he would pick up the reactor or the crew cabin and move it around the site. Whether it had to be put in a bunker, go over and put it, get, get it ready to be lifted into the aircraft. All over was hardened uh, cameras. There were video cameras all over the place on this thing because you, you're not out there and you need to watch what's happening under the crane. You need to watch everything that's happening on site. So there was a lot of uh, video cameras all over the place. But that was, you can tell, that was a lot of work to build that crane and make it mobile like that. This is the configuration of the B-36. The crew cabin's up here, uh, in here, and right behind the crew cabin is an instrumentation module. There was a lot of instrumentation required to keep track of not just the aircraft, but to keep track of that reactor because we're flying under very unusual conditions here. That's right here. And the big deal is how do you shield the crew? Well, we've already put the, shield, the crew in a 12-ton leaded capsule. Uh, but that was not 100% enough to protect them from radiation. They did what was called distributed shielding, and they put a great big lead disc right in the center. It did not extend out. I, sh I have it extended out in this drawing just to show you what it looked like. But it, it was inside the aircraft, but it was, uh, I forget how thick, it was pretty thick. But they were trying to, this is the reactor, they're trying to prevent radiation from moving forward up into the, uh, into the crew area. This is the reactor down in here that was being lifted into the uh, bomb bay. And like I said, it's a water moderated, water cooled reactor. So they had two separate systems for the two sources of water here and here. And it was uh, air, dry, uh, air cooled. There's scoops, I'll show you in a minute, there's scoops on the side here that will scoop up air and come in and run through the evaporator uh, or heat exchanger and uh, cool the water. And of course, another TV camera back here keeping track of everything. So it's what they call variable shielding, distributed shielding. Uh, you can't just build an aircraft all lead. That's not going to work. So that's what the, uh, that was the configuration of the test plane. It looked like this. Here's the scoops on the side, one on the other side also. And it, they maxed it out right up to the max weight of it. Well, here comes the interesting thing. Uh, why did they put it in the bomb bay? Well, if they got in trouble, what are you going to do? Dump. Dump it. And they did. They had, a, they had a program put together to where if the aircraft got in trouble, they would jettison the reactor and get it out of the airplane. <laughs> You'll see in a minute when we talk about the engine, uh, well, let me go on to that later. Anyway, we'll deal with this. Uh, the other thing that was happening during all of these test flights is the aircraft was being flanked with two other aircraft. On the right-hand side was a radiation aircraft that was mapping the radiation field. If the, uh, if the test uh, aircraft is here, there's one over here that's flying around, behind, and in front of doing a doing a complete mapping of the radiation field around the aircraft. That's what's uh, taking place over here. That's the uh, mapping aircraft. Then there's another aircraft over here. That aircraft is filled with paramedic paratroopers that if they have to jettison the reactor, the reactor is going to go down right now. It'll be on the ground quickly. It takes a while for the paratroopers to get down. So the paratroopers, they're all hooked up, ready to go. They punch the buzzer, and they're, and they're gone. But it takes them a while to get to the ground, unbuckled, etc. Then they have to go back and find the reactor, cordon it off, and protect it to keep it away from people. 
I never, I never found out how they protect those people. Uh, there was no, there was no protection for the current medics that went down there. They never had to, they never had to eject the reactor, so it never was tested. But they were, it was live on every point. They were hooked up, ready to go. All good weather testing because you're doing some very critical testing. It was all good weather testing. I, uh, all that they, they did. Uh, uh, as I said, 47 flights in, uh, in a two-year period, and we'll talk about the uh, flight pattern for those past. This is where flight testing took place. The aircraft, the uh, B-36, was headquartered out of Texas, where Convair is uh, stationed. And they flew a path here, up in Mexico, of one in Oregon. I'll get to those in a minute. This one down here over the Gulf, as they were doing testing, they flew over, but did they go over? No, the sensors never picked up anything because they're going fast, they're very high, and there was no sensing. So they kept lowering. Well, they got down pretty low before they could even sense radiation going overhead. Well, they didn't want to go down any lower, you know, too low, even get too low on this program. So they modified the program and they went out over the Gulf and did very, very low level testing where you could have boats and monitors uh, monitoring. So they, they needed to get some realistic data and that's how they got the, the realistic low level data is out over here. They continued to do the other testing. They said Con uh, Condor's headquartered here at Coswell. They did an Abilene to Brownsfield path and that was specifically chosen because there's, it's a lack of, in, in that day, back in that day, there was a lack of people. It was a, it was a non-populated path. So they used that for some of their tests. They also used a path from Hobbs up to Roswell as another path that was very sparsely uh, populated. And then they did a very long flight uh, all the way through Washington and Oregon uh, this path here, and they wanted to fly over vegetation to see what the effect was. These were fair, not real high altitude flights. These were fairly low level flights, and they never sensed any effect on the vegetation as they uh, flew over them. So that was the flight testing. It was basically they proved that there's very little radiation. The aircraft can fly over people and have almost uh, zero effect. So that did a lot to get rid of the elephant. We've got data now. We've got proof of what the radiation is. So now let's go ahead and build, a, build an engine. And to do that, I want to make sure we're all on the same page about how a, a jet engine operates. It's a very simple process, but the materials engineering piece of it is very complicated. Uh, there's a compressor up here that compresses, if, if you're on the tarmac and just starting up an engine, it has a 20 to 1 compression ratio, and it will compress the air until it heats up to about 350 degrees in the combustion chamber. It also happens to be moving about 350 miles an hour, approximately. And you squirt in chemical fuel, there's an explosion, goes through the turbine, it gets nozzled down into thrust, and you get the output thrust of the engine. So that, the, the basic function of a jet engine and what the process was is the typical temperature range in the combustion chamber is as shown here. They picked about the middle of the range to where they felt was going to be safe to run a nuclear engine. They picked we, 1900 degrees. We need to achieve to have a safety factor lower and higher for the reactor, and that was the uh, that was the program goal was to hit 1,900 degrees in the combustion chamber. There was also in the scientific community there was a lot of skepticism that you absolutely had to have chemical fuel run a jet engine. You couldn't run it any other way. And of course, they said, "Well, you, you know, I can put an electric heater in there and run it." No, you can't. So they actually built a small jet engine, put a coffee heater in there, big power cord, and ran it. It ran just fine. 
All you got to do is get that up to 350 degrees where you have automatic combustion when you squirt a chemical fuel in, it, it'll run. So, but they had to go through that step just to, to quiet down some of the skeptics. So we got past that stage, and when I said there were two separate programs, here's, here's one, of the, one of the programs. It was a Pratt Whitney uh, design of this engine. This is the one that was intellectual. It, really, it was lasted about two years, never really got off the drawing board. And it was what was called the indirect cycle. The nuclear reactor is over here. They use a liquid metal or some transfer agent and a heat exchanger down here in the combustion chamber. And the concept is fine, but the weight is not. This is so weight intensive, you can't possibly build an build a, a aircraft with this. So it never really went very far, but it needed to be explored. There were no prototypes. It, it never even got to hardly off the drawing board after two years. So that was the indirect approach. What I'm going to talk about is the direct approach, which is to put a nuclear reactor right in the combustion chamber, or put the heat, put the heat in the combustion chamber. So that's what the GE program uh, was all about. They picked uh, the J47. It was the most popular, highest produced engine uh, by General Electric, had already regularly uh, exceeded Mach 1, which they wanted to achieve, and was a very reliable engine. So this is the engine. Most, a, a lot of this will stay the same, some of that won't, but the combustion chambers in here is what, what needs to be modified to be able to put a nuclear reactor in. The build was here in Evendale, and, and the testing was out in Idaho. The, um, chemical fuel testing was all done here. The nuclear testing was done at the Idaho site. So there was a shuttle that ran back and forth on a regular basis. Uh, it, this was, you know, 1950s, so it was an eight-hour flight on a <coughs> DC-8 just to get out to Iowa. Uh, you come to work in the morning, get on an airplane, go to Idaho, come back on Friday night, and all you told your wife was, I'm going to be out of town for the week. You, had, you couldn't talk about what you did. It was very, very secret. But this is one of the flights uh, that they did. OK, let's, let's go through the concept of the engine. The first thing that happened, and I don't know, I never found out exactly how this happened, but somebody got to Congress very early in the program, and they legislated that you could not uh, have an aircraft take off in the United States under nuclear power. It had to take off under chemical power. So the, the uh, legislation was I could take off under chemical power, I get to 5,000 feet, then I could start transitioning into nuclear power, and by 10,000 feet, I could be at uh, nuclear power. And so that was the flight profile. Obviously, that's going to add a lot of complexity to the engine. So now I'm not just building a nuclear-powered engine. I'm building both combined into one engine. But that's, that's the restrictions. I'm not going to talk about this much. This was the largest part of the entire program. George Pomeroy, my mentor, uh, was in charge of this. And the entire program progressed at the speed at which they solved these issues. I mean, you've got things going away in a high nuclear field here. A Teflon, 120 hours oil is, is deteriorating in 200 hours. So they had to go through and fix all of these issues because they're part of the just normal construction, gaskets, O-rings, etc. Uh, a large part of the program, a lot of the technical journals are about what they, how they went about hardening all of these materials. So I just want to acknowledge that it was a huge part of the program and uh, a lot of respect for all of the chemists and physicists that uh, produced that. A lot of good things came out of the program, even though the United States did not fly a nuclear aircraft at the end. There was so much uh, research done that two of today's ANSI standards, 100%, came out of this program, uh, particularly the safety standards uh, I'll tell one, one short story. Uh, I'd spent a lot of time with George. I'd go over and we'd sit and talk and he'd, he'd get out documents. And 
one day we're sitting there talking and the phone rings. And this happened to be right at the time that the tsunami hit Japan, flooded the basement, knocked out the backup generators and their reactors overheated. It was Japan. And, and George was very popular all over the world. He gave technical talks all over the world. Uh, nuclear people knew him in, in, uh, around the world. So it was Japan's uh, nuclear people, and they basically said, George, help. Um, what do we do? You know, the reactor had just exploded. And it was a very short conversation. He said, read the book. He said, the data hasn't changed. Open the book, read what we wrote. And that's how they proceeded then to, to do the cleanup work on their reactors, was literally the standards out of the uh, AMP program. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do is prove a concept. Can we really power a jet engine? Uh, and can we heat that air sufficiently to uh, cause uh, a jet engine to do what it has to do? You need fuel, obviously, so they picked the uh, uh, I mean, uranium was, was the choice then. Low fuel pellets, not all that different necessarily than, from what you do today. And it had to be concentrated. Uh, uranium, as it comes out of the ground, is typically less than 1% uh, concentrated. If you concentrate it for power plants, it's up in this area somewhere 5, 6, 7% maybe. If you do it weapons grade, and that's what you all we're experts at is you push it up to an economic limit, 90 percent ish. It's an economic uh, issue at some point to where it's not worth any more money to push it. They did push it to 93 percent for aircraft uh, power, but uh, it's again, it's an economic issue. So they started with nickel chromium, uh, uranium oxide, or what was that? with the uranium dispersion, and eventually moved into beryllium oxide for the fuel. We'll see two different test stands that they ran that fuel test on. But after they proved that they could power a jet engine under nuclear power, then it became a fuel. It, came up, it became a, an issue for a whole bunch of other things. What's the best fuel? What's the best concentration? Uh, a lot of issues there. So that's what proceeded. The fuel pellets were in a heat sink and the heat sink looks like this, like that picture, and you can see this later. Uh, it's an incredible amount of engineering went into these little cartridges because you've got stainless steel, this is stainless steel, melts at 2250 and you've got uh, 1900 degrees regularly going through this. You don't want the metal to soften, you don't want flutter, you need a laminated airflow through this thing, and there were numerous designs. This is the one that finally worked very well, and became the uh, fuel cartridge, a uh, fuel holder, I should say. And there's a, a different design they had. There was numerous designs to try to get stability and laminate flow because this cartridge is very long. It went in a cartridge that looked like this. There's two of them here. You're welcome to look at them afterwards. They're sharp, um, so be careful. There's 13 cartridges here stacked together it went in the reactor like this, and there's a three inch version and a three and a half inch version of the uh, of the fuel holder. Is the purple the fuel? I'm sorry, yes, the pink is the fuel, or purple, yes, right in here. That's the, that's the little fuel pellet. It's, I didn't measure, but it's, I don't think it's barely a half inch in diameter, and uh, Maybe that, like fuel holders, maybe an inch thick kind of thing. So that that became the uh, the cartridge, and then the you needed a moderator. They started out on the first test reactor; it was water moderated, and then they 
trying to minimize the mechanics involved in running a nuclear engine. So they went to hydrated zirconium, and it's automatically good to a very high temperature. And they considered putting holes in the moderator, uh, but that stability-wise, that was not very workable. So they went with just a solid, solid uh, ceramic. So basically, the, the moderator was that hydrated zirconium, and looked like this. Not not all that different from the way any normal uh, nuclear reactor power plant reactor works. They're stacked together in in bundles, uh, put together, and looks like this. Oh, I should mention ceramic. Where are you going to get high quality ceramic in this country? Well, we're just coming out of World War II. Beer production had been down. Coors Brewery was looking for some business to keep the company going. They purchased uh, the Harold China Pottery Company and made laboratory grade uh, china for, for labs. And so that was the best ceramic you could get in the country. So they contracted with Coors to, uh, to make those uh, moderators. And that's where they came from. This is the bundle. That's the cartridges. This is a, uh, the, the case. This is what actually what it looked like here. Those are the cartridges. It's filled out to the edge out here. And that then becomes the reactor. I show control rods here. I don't know where the control rods were. I just randomly put them in there. The difference here between that, this, and a power plant reactor is you've got to have a hole at the center because the shaft of the engine is running laterally to the engine. So there is a hole in the center here for the, to, for the shaft to, to go through the reactor. There was water cooling around it in terms of cooling the reactor. So it was uh, moderated with a solid and cooled with a liquid. If you read all the documentation, the press was not particularly kind to this program. It's secret, extremely secret, and it, obviously you can't tell what's really going on. The word got out that they had an uncontrolled meltdown, and that's not true. They did not have an uncontrolled meltdown. In the reactor was sensors all over the place. And one of the temperature sensors went bad. Uh, one section of the reactor melted down some a cartridge, and that's what it looked like. Uh, it was not an uncontrolled meltdown. They, the other sensors picked it up. They shut the reactor down, and things were fine. But when the press got a hold of it, it was oh, they had a they had a meltdown. No, they didn't. That was what it looked like. They did, any good engineering project has testing. You do a lot of non-destructive testing. Well, they also did destructive testing. And they took 500 gallons of jet fuel, put it in a reactor, and set it on fire. And the cartridges did just fine. They never got up to the belly temperature of stainless steel and proved that the cartridge could survive a, a fuel off from of, uh, jet fuel. Okay, let's build the test reactor, the first one to approve the concept that we can, in fact, do this. And we've got the reactor. The reactor's right here, area for the control rods to be pulled up. And what we're going to do is we're going to push in cold air into the top of the reactor and bring the hot air out the bottom up here. And we're going to pipe that into a jet engine. That will go in, the air comes in, the compressor of the engine comes out, goes up and through the reactor, the hot air comes back up and comes back in into the turbine section where it goes into the turbine blades. And then the normal process of no <coughs> nozzling it down. And that was the, that's the, the, if you will, the diagram of how the first test reactor was built. It was called high high temperature reactor experiment number one. And it looked like that. Oh, the other thing I should mention is, you see this right here? If you back up, 
you see that right there, that is a bypass valve because I had to prove that I could smoothly transition from chemical fuel into nuclear fuel. So that's a bypass valve. So you're running under nuclear, you, you uh, open that valve, close, the, close these, and run that air back into here. That's a combustion chamber where you squirt in chemical fuel. And so they had this transition from one to the other. And that was how they did that in the test stamp. And those tests, uh, they went very well. This is what the actual engine looked like. There's the two ports coming out, one coming out from the compressor, and the back one here, it's hooked up. Uh, it's, it's come in through the compressor, comes up, it's gonna go up to the reactor, gets heated, and comes back down, and is put into the turbine piece of the engine. This is what a first test stand looked like. It's the the uh, reactor is mounted vertically in this container. There's two J47 engines laying down here, and I've got a little better picture here, but uh, you can see the ductwork here and the bypass valve. Here's a little better picture. Uh, the air coming out of the compressor, going up into the reactor, coming out of the reactor up here and down into the rest of the jet engine. That's the crossover uh, valve and this is the combustion chamber in here. And that is, so this would be uh, test experiment number one, HCRE1. Hey, that's a six foot fence, right? Or eight foot fence? I assume. I assume normally, it's not a big guy, that's a... Oh, this is huge. Yes. Yeah, well, I've got better pictures. Yeah, it took, uh, took two railroad tracks just to move it. Um, okay, so... That experiment went very well. They proved that they could run a jet engine under nuclear power, and they achieved 1,900 degrees, or they achieved, I'm sorry, they achieved 18, 1,850 degrees, the goal's 1,900. Well, that became a piece of cake because you've got all the lo losses in this ductwork here, so I am easily can hit the goal, the program goal, and they did, and they exceeded it because uh, I'll talk about the math after that. So, uh, number two, I uh, started experimenting with, uh, with fuels. The, uh, that's where they got into the, uh, the beryllium oxide fuels. And they used this test stand to uh, test out uh, different ideas that they had for fuel. There was a third test stand, and the one that they did most of the testing on, and it ran two reactors. When you, did, when you do the math, one reactor would power four engines, and it seemed doable. But from a practical standpoint, do I want to lose four engines if I have a problem with the reactor? So they backed down to just two engines on a single reactor, and that's what the build-out was. This is, uh, this is what it looked like in the test stand. Now, when you see the test stand, it's going to look a lot bigger, but that's what the uh, concept was. The reactor is uh, laid down horizontally, and the cold air is pushed in the back back here, comes up through the reactor, and split, comes out the back end for, uh, for the two jet engines. And the flight shield is on. Uh, there were some pictures here where the, the flight shield had not been uh, put on the engine. So that's uh, HTRE3, the experiment number three. They did, uh, continued to do fuel testing, but they did a lot of power testing, a lot of, uh, make sure you can transfer from chemical to nuclear and back and forth and do it smoothly. The pilot will have good control. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, all the chemical testing was done here in Evendale. The nuclear was out in Idaho, and if you've never been to Idaho, which I have not, uh, not, not a lot of people around, and the test facility is over there where that arrow is. It looks like this. This is offices and et cetera. This is a hot shop where you could take in a live test stand uh, and, and work on it and change the fuel and do what you, you want to do. The test site is off at the back of the site back here, and you got to it by railroad tracks that went from back and forth from the test stand to the hot shop. The, 
out at the test site, this is the back end of the test site. The, the test rig is actually sitting over here. It's not there right now, but uh, the exhaust from the engine is gonna be hot. So it's run through some absorbers to, uh, so they're not spewing radiation out into the facility. These are earthen and uh, concrete barriers built around the site. That's the hot shop back here. And this is the railroad tracks that head out to the test site. It's dual tracks because of the because of the weight they're they're running. Uh, the, each, each test stand weighs about 300 ton. And as they're as you're in the hot shop, there's a lot of um, remote capability here. There's two turntables that you can put a reactor on, turn it around. There are articulated arms that come in from the side. There's manipulators, and there's also an artic articulated overhead crane. If you look at a populated hot shot, here's a, a live reactor sitting on a turntable. There's something else sitting on that turntable down here. And then there's definitions, what everything is, is doing around here. But it was a very, uh, very compact hot shot, but you could get a lot of good work done in there. So that's when they're preparing for a test or finishing a test, this is where the test, the entire test stamp would be uh, pushed in here and the reactor would be taken out, worked on, put back in the test stamp. We're up at the top end of the hot shop and you're looking through six feet of, uh, of glass filled with uh, um, zinc bromide. I'm not sure what they're doing back here, but you can see a couple turntables here. Uh, they're in process of changing changing things over. The manipulators look like this. When you're on the shielded side of that wall, this is what the, the manipulators look like. Again, it's analog days, vacuum tubes, uh, uh, servo systems, um, but they work very, very well. They have very tight control as I read through all the documentation. Uh, there was two of these manipulators here, and then there was a uh, another manipulator that ran these arms here. So they could do quite a bit of work remotely, but they couldn't do it all. This is a sign where he's picking up a reactor, and I draw your attention right here. There's two people in there, and it's really hot in there. So what are those two people doing in there? Well. Like I said, the manipulators can't do all the work, so you need real people. Sometimes it's just hard to take the nut off my bolt. So I need a real person to put a wrench on there and take the nut off. So they commandeered people out of Evendale. I, I, I had no evidence that they took any women. They took all the men and would take them out of Evendale, they'd get a trip to Idaho, they would spend two days in training, learning how to take this nut off and put it back on or whatever they're doing. And after two days, they were incredibly skilled at doing whatever task they had to do. And they could be in the hot shop for eight minutes. So they got their eight minutes in the hot shop right here take whatever they did, and then they get on the airplane and go back home, and, and they're good for the year. So that's how they got the, the, the delicate work done. This is one of the crews, one of the airplanes full. They're being briefed on their task for the week. And uh, I just I find that absolutely amazing. But anyway, that's, that's how they got a lot of the work done in the hot shop. This is the full build out of the test stand. There's the reactor that you recognize there. This is a rain snow shield, a lot of snow in Idaho, so you had to protect it and look like that. It, when it gets pushed into the test stand, the, the, the locomotive and everything else pulls away and it's coupled up to a couple of ports here that go out and push that exhaust into a stack to where it's uh, uh, decontaminated. You'll notice a lot of big banks of light because when you, if you're going to do a, a, a 2500 hour test, it's 24 7. So you've got video cameras all over, there's video cameras all over the place, of course all hardened, 
and monitoring everything that's going on. So that's one of the test sites. That's probably a number, uh, HTRE 2 right there. Uh, they had to push it around, so you needed a locomotive. And so this is a hardened locomotive, uh, again, five feet of uh, leaded glass. He's looking through because you've got a hot reactor right in front of you, so you don't have a choice. You've got to really lead this thing down. This is heavily leaded. That's the operator, and his job was just to push it from the hot shop, take it out to the test site, and bring it back and uh, do it safely. If you're going to have a nuclear-powered aircraft, it's hot, you need a hangar. You need some place to store it, so they built a hardened hangar. And this is the hangar that the aircraft was to be stored in once, it, once the engine got mounted in, a, in an aircraft. It was huge. That's a person right there. It's a uh, very large building, all leaded, all leaded doors, concrete uh, on the side here. I've got a better picture to show the concrete. Whoops. Uh, concrete barriers. The roof is all lead, and it was done like this, where there, it's a lattice network, where lead panels are dropped in these little squares here, and, and that way you get the entire roof leaded. But that's that's how the uh, the roof got leaded. It was a completely uh, shielded facility. That's what it looked like when they finished. The program got killed. They never they never monitored it pliable engine in an aircraft, so they never used the facility. I don't know what they're doing with it today. But, yeah, so that's, that was the, the mechanism to safely uh, store the reactor. As I said, one reactor will run two uh, engines, but there's application to where you want to run, where you just need one engine. So they did build a version to where you have a reactor here for what was called a single inline engine and it looked like this. Uh, this is the compressor in here, nozzle back here, and the reactor is in here. Uh, that was a full, full build out, ran on the test stand very successfully, uh, was a very successful engine. Produced a, a great deal of thrust, uh, it ex exceeded their expectations for thrust. And that's what $1 billion will get you. <laughs> um, the, more, the more realistic approach was they wanted to run two engines off of one reactor, so we had to build a, uh, a dual reactor. The model, this is the model. The real engine is here. Um, this is the uh, compressor in here. It gets combined right here in a combiner, runs through the reactor, and then get split out again and pushed down into the uh, turbine part of the engine, and that was a uh, that was a full build out, um, very successful test run. Right in here, these are the the combustion chambers where you squirt in chemical fuel because this engine had to uh, very smoothly transition from nuclear to chemical. And, they, and both ends, the single inline and the dual uh, did that, and that's, that's the combustion chambers for the chemical fuel. I should mention, uh, you have to spin these up when you're on the runway and the big engine. So there's a 500 horsepower pneumatic engine. The bu little bubble you see at the front of an aircraft looks like a, a, a shield. It's actually housing a starter engine. <coughs> And that's a 500 horsepower uh, pneumatic starter engine. The, and so uh, that was very successful. They, they, were, they were very happy. They had a working inline single engine. They had a working uh, uh, dual uh, configuration that worked very well, ran very well on the test stand, didn't really have any operational issues, if you will, on the uh, on the test stand. They built a manipulator nicknamed the Beetle, and this was a remote controlled device that you run around and fix things if they get 
go broke. You, you never know. This is the first ever, never do, never done before. You don't know what's going to go wrong, so you build as much as you can to try to anticipate repairing it. And this was a, a, a vehicle to go around and fix things. It had articulated arms on it, and operator is in here. Of course, he's looking through, I think, 12 inches of leaded glass right here. They're showing it. It was very well designed. You could pick up an egg without cracking it. They also had a lady swinging. <laughs> I didn't show that picture, but they had a lady swinging on it. Um, there's the operator. If you look down inside, that's him. And this is his view. He's looking through the leaded glass. And this is before joysticks. Boy, wouldn't we love to have joysticks. He didn't have joysticks. If he wants to move left, he's got to push that button on right, left a little bit, push the stop. Oh, I want to go up. Got to hit that button up, this one down. And how he kept track of all these, all these buttons, I have no idea. But that's how he ran the manipulators, was, uh, was through that. And there were cameras. He had, a, he had a, a glass in the bottom that he could see down through the beetle and straight out. And then he had uh, video of area around him. It was a pretty complicated uh, Thing. This is acceptance testing. It would go up 15 feet, and uh, one of the supervisors is standing up there to give you an idea of the size of this thing. So we've got a successful engine. Uh, the program got canceled. Never had, never got put into an aircraft. But there was an enormous amount of what was called good fallout. Uh, you could read through this list, but just reducing the, the size of a reactor was a huge accomplishment. Shielding, uh, the metallurgy, everything that George uh, Pomeroy did uh, was uh, was still used today. It was it was the <coughs> defining research that really set the standards for a lot of the nuclear activity that went forward. Before I finish, I need to talk about this, and that is you saw the picture where the Russians flew a, a nuclear bomber. And there were several publications in Aviation Week. Uh, this is one that came out in 1958, of talking about details of their program. They had other publications, and so on. Well, was that true? <laughs> no, it's not. It turns out. That's the picture we showed before. They claimed they had 40 flights of a nuclear-powered aircraft. So what happened? David Carpenter, the guy that wrote the book, still I talk to David every once in a while, he gets a package in the mail one day. In the package are pictures, artifacts, and a letter. He says, Dear David, I'm a test pilot off of a Russian aircraft that was nuclear-powered. And I wanted you to know that everything we told you in the 50s was not true. There had been a spy at Evendale in the very early part of the program, and documents that they produced was going straight to Russia. They rewrote them, published them, and all, everything you saw published in Aviation Week mm -hmm. was made up. It, it was interesting because the comments from engineers here said, hmm. They're, they're following the same path we are. They never connected the dots. The dots never got connected because they modified the technical approach just enough to kind of make it look authentic. And so the first thing the letter did said that was all propaganda. We never built anything. We never did any research. It was all just using your documents. Well, the letter didn't stop there. If the letter went on to say, well, we really did build a nuclear-powered aircraft. When we canceled the program in 1961, Russia started. They had all our documentation. They had all our engineering research. We laid out the, the roadmap for them to do it. So they spent the next 10 years building uh, a nuclear aircraft. It was not jet powered. It was dual prop uh, uh, engines. But they, they built a uh, nuclear powered aircraft and flew it. This is what the aircraft looked like. These are some of the pictures that were in that uh, package that David received. He also sent a picture. They 
they copied what we did. They, they did a test. They had a reactor in the bombardier cage. And somebody on the tarmac one day, somebody accidentally pushed the button and dropped it out and smashed it. And that's what the, <laughs> that's what this picture is here. So he was, you know, he, he's being honest. He showed them their failures also. So unfortunately, the reason they made so much quick progress on the program was their concern for human life is not what ours is. They put in no shielding. There's no shielding in the aircraft at all for any of the personnel. And most of the personnel perished just a few years after the flights, unfortunately, sadly. There were a couple of people, I don't know why or where they were sitting in the aircraft, that survived. And one of those is the ones that wrote that letter, uh, I think in 89, I think he got that package in 89, that wrote the letter and just says, you know, I think you ought to know. And the United States never, ever knew that Russia actually did fly a nuclear-powered aircraft. Not safely, crew perished, but uh, they did do it. So, as I uh, finish things up here, I want to briefly talk about the future. Uh, I'm not here to, to describe the future. What I want to talk about is something that happened a couple of years ago. Um, I got a phone call from this gentleman, Jake Heckler. He was just finishing his PhD in nuclear engineering out of Berkeley, and shortly thereafter he accepted a fellowship at MIT. And its fellowship is in uh, nuclear-powered aircraft, what they call air-breathing power, uh, air-breathing propulsion. And it's for global safety. The, the uh, program is labeled as global safety, which kind of what the other program was. The research component of it is being, will, not yet started, but will be conducted at Livermore uh, Labs. And so um, Jake wanted to be here tonight just to have a conversation with you all, but he's so in, involved in that program right now that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't be here, but he, uh, he wanted to be. And he has the highest respect. He's talked to a couple of people here at Mound, has the highest respect for everything that went on here at Mound Labs. He has single-handedly talked to all of the nuclear research facilities from Oregon to Livermore, uh, Oak Ridge, Cambridge, all the, all the facilities. He is single-handedly pulling together combined knowledge of modern materials used in the nuclear field uh, because there's quite a bit of feeling that nuclear-powered uh, aircraft is not dead. I can't say it's alive, but at least it's being funded by some research and a person that has a lot of passion for it. So, all right, so that brings me to the end. Uh, it promised to be an hour, and it's just about an hour. So, with that, I, I don't have a nuclear background, but if you have questions, I will try to, try to answer them. Thank you.